Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 7 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Boy, if we had listened to those words when we were 17, right? When we were 15, 16, you have a lifetime of possibilities ahead of you. You're beginning to experience life as you have grown. And you will realize that there will be many doors that will open and some other ones that will close. Somebody very wisely told me once that for every door that we open in life, we close many others as well. How many doors have we knocked on? How many choices have we had to face in life? Somebody else said that choices are the hinges of destiny. You make a choice, and under every choice, there is this thing called responsibility. Your actions have consequences. For good or for bad, we're going to find out that many of those consequences will open opportunities or close some other ones. How do we choose? How do we make the best out of what's been given to us? Well, in this verse, it says that there's a way to go about living that relies not on our own wisdom, not on our own resources, but on God's. If you acknowledge him in all of your ways, even when we make the wrong choices, even when we don't get it right all the time, he promises to make our path straight. The Lord present in our life is the one who has the capacity to lead us even when we don't know. Even when we are in the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil for he is with us. When the Lord is our shepherd, we know that he knows. We know that he knows, and that's better than what we know. Today, we are going to continue our sermon series in Acts 18, talking about the second missionary journey, and we're going to see a few things. We're going to see that there are some doors in life that will open for the gospel and some other ones that will close. And knowing how to walk in those circumstances will be very important to see that our life fulfills its purpose to be fruitful for Christ. If we are becoming a disciple-maker, multiplying church, there's a tension between staying in a place too long and going to a new mission field where God is calling us that we will have to navigate. And the FBC family, I believe with all my heart that God is preparing this congregation for a greater season of fruitfulness. God is preparing this congregation to invest our lives, not just in the younger generation and older generations, not just generationally, but also to reach out to all nations. Now, obviously, the Great Commission is so much bigger than any church alone can do. But we can be part of a movement of disciple maker multiplying churches reaching not just to our Jerusalem, but from our Jerusalem to the ends of the earth in whatever capacity God allows us. We do have many limitations, but we have the one necessary thing that we need to reach out to people with hope, and it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to be stewards of that message. We have to bring it to the ends of the earth. There will be some doors that will open, some other ones that will close, even in our own congregation. I'm so grateful for these grads that have been in a process of spiritual formation where they have learned to trust Jesus, to, to feed on his word, to share the gospel with other people. But now, as they grow, every one of us will have to face the choice of sticking together, walking with Christ, or pulling away to do whatever it is that we want or we are told by the world. Which one is it going to be? What doors are we going to walk through? Are we going to persevere when some doors close? And wait for God to open some other ones. How will we know what is right and what is wrong? So come with me. If you have your Bible, I will invite you to open it in Acts 18. Acts chapter 18 is the end of the second missionary journey. And the gospel finally makes it to a very unlikely place, the city of Corinth. The city of Corinth was kind of like the Vegas of the ancient world. Sin city. You want to gamble? Of course you can. We have the Isthmian Games. As big as the Olympic Games, well, not quite as big, but pretty close. Do you need money? There is plenty of job opportunity. There is plenty of wealth. There is plenty of entertainment. There is everything you want to do if you just want to have fun. If you want to be a material girl, there, this is your city. 
If you want to be a boy that wants to have fun, this is your city. So we're going to take a look at Corinth. And before we go in chapter 18, I want to remind you of what happened a chapter before. In chapter 17, the gospel is making it to different places, makes it to Thessalonica, makes it to Berea, makes it to Athens. Some places is well received, some other places not so much, like Athens, uh, it's just an intellectual curiosity. But the gospel stirs up persecution. And Paul is jumping from place to place because he's risking his life for others to know Jesus Christ. He's facing incredible persecution to the point of risking his life. So the gospel is being jumping from one place to another through persecution. But here's the beautiful thing. The enemy means to use persecution to silence the witness of Christians, putting our life in danger, even sometimes when Christians die for their faith. But you know what God does through persecution? Instead of allowing Christians to stay comfortably in one place, the Lord blows on that fire so that the gospel can jump from city to city to city. And previous places that were strongholds of the enemy now get a chance to hear of the redeeming and saving power of Jesus Christ. So even in the midst of persecution, God is still in control and God is sovereign. Yes, Satan is like a roaring lion looking for people to devour, but he's a lion that has a very short leash. God has everything under control, and in his providential purposes, sometimes he allows the affliction of his saints, but he always, always allows that with a purpose. He never wastes the suffering of his saints, never. Always allows their suffering to be a mirror image of the suffering of Jesus Christ, a redemptive suffering that shows the world the love of God. So Paul is being an ambassador, showing with his very life what Jesus' message is all about. Jesus' message is is an appeal to people to believe in Jesus Christ, to faith, not to be forced, not to be under compulsion to believe this or that, for people to trust Jesus Christ. That's what faith is all about, is knowing what is right, is agreeing with what is right, and being willing to personally entrust ourselves to somebody else as our Lord and Savior, that one being Jesus Christ. So the gospel is making it all over the ancient world, and through that persecution, finally makes it to Corinth. Now, several doors have been closed before, especially the doors to the Jewish people. Paul, in every city that he goes, first speaks the gospel to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Why? Because God called the people of Israel first to be the ones who were stewards of the, of the word of God and the promises of God and the covenants of God. They were the ones that Messiah was promised to, and through them, God would bless all the nations. As he said to Abraham, in you will be blessed all the nations. But the Jewish people had rejected Messiah. And unfortunately, their hearts were hardened because of unbelief. Sometimes, 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 even when God wants to bless us, we're not willing to receive his blessings because of unbelief. And some doors will close. Some doors will close for those who are not willing to trust God. Unfortunately, the Jewish people were those ones. The gospel would make it to the synagogues. There would be disagreement. Most of them would not believe. A few would believe. But when that door closed, God opened other doors. So we're, we're about to read chapter 18, but the question we'll be dealing with today is this. What does God do when unbelief closes the doors of a community to the gospel of Jesus Christ? What will we do when unbelief closes the doors to a, of a community to the gospel of Jesus Christ? By the way, this could be a community like our town. This could be a relationship. This could be a family member. This could be somebody that because unbelief, because of unbelief, doesn't want to come to Jesus Christ, either in saving faith or even when we're walking already in faith. Sometimes even believers go through seasons of rebelliousness or unbelief, don't we? Well, not in this church, in other churches, of course. Yeah, we do struggle. We do struggle to grow and take God at face value. What happens? when unbelief closes some of the doors that God wants to use to bless you? What happens when God says, do this, and we stubbornly cling to unconfessed and unrepentant sin? Well, we're going to see what happens today. So if you have your Bible, let's go ahead and read chapter 18. Now, chapter 18 is a little bit of a lengthy chapter, but let me tell you this. God has already said it best. So if you don't remember anything of what I'm going to say today, please remember 
that you have a Bible and that you can come back and listen to what God has already said right here. Your job and my job is to come to the Lord and let his word speak to us. And then here's the job of a preacher. The job of a preacher is struggling with this word to make sure that we encourage one another to obey and to follow what he has already said best. I'm not going to say better. I'm not going to be more inspirational or attractive than what God has already said. God has already said it best. But my job is now to live it out and for you and I to go together. So my job is to help you see and to struggle with what God has said so we can be obedient to this. Success in our ministry looks like obedience, like faithfulness to God's word. And that's hopefully what we're going to do today. So come with me. Acts 18. It's going to take us a little while. We're going to read the whole passage today, but I want you to pay attention to what happens when the Word of God makes it to a place and when some doors close and some other ones open. Let's take a look at it. Acts chapter 18, verse 1 says this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, to leave Rome and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were ten makers by trade. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greek. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. Many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. He stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, say to yourselves, I refuse to be a judge of these things. He drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila, at Sencre, they, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on, take, on, on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail for, from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a na native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the, th the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So what happens when some doors are closed because of unbelief to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, here's the, the bad news. 
Doors will close. It will be rough. There will be persecution. There will be uncertainty. There will be very tense moments as you choose to follow Jesus Christ. Now, not only that, there will be spiritual, powerful confrontations. There are forces in every community that oppose the freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are spiritual forces. There are political forces. There are all sorts of forces, as we've seen in Acts, that will oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ. Close. Doors will close. But here's the good news. For every door that closes, God opens many others. And when God opens a door, no one can shut those doors. God wants to open doors, not just for the good looking ones, not just for the privileged ones, not just for the ones that have been faithfully awaiting his promises. He wants to open doors of salvation in the unlikeliest and darkest of places. And boy, that place was the city of Corinth. Corinth was a city that was one of the most prominent cities in the ancient world. It was a wealthy city. It had about half a million inhabitants. It was a powerful commercial center. But here's the thing. The city had already been destroyed by the Romans before. And about 44 BC, um, it had been re rebuilt by the, by the Romans. Um, but it was, it was a city that had people from all over the Roman world. It was populated by people who belonged everywhere but there. And it was a very idolatrous and very immoral city. It had legalized prostitution, both male and female. It had all sorts of gambling opportunities, kind of like I said before, the Vegas of the ancient world. But right here is where the gospel gets there. And check this out. Goring is one of the cities where Paul spends the longest affirming the gospel. God opens the door of opportunity for Paul so that the gospel can grow and flourish. And I want to share with you three things today. I want to share with you, well, here's, here's Corinth right here, the, the very strategic position between those two pieces of water, those bodies of water, and a lot of commerce went from, from Asia into Rome, and that was a, a very, very wealthy city. But I want to share a couple of things with you. When unbelief closes the doors of a community to the gospel, God opens other doors to establish the gospel in obscure and unlikely places by giving his people Three strategic resources. The first one is this. God gives you position. Look, look with me. Verses 1 again to verse, um, verse 1 to verse 17. God gives you position. Do you notice how when the gospel makes it there, there are different reactions to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Some people reject, some people receive. But here's the thing. The gospel makes it to Corinth. All as he knew that the gospel had to make it to the ends of the earth, he's going from town to town based on how he's received and how he's welcome, but he's not just going to any towns. In fact, his missionary strategy was focused on reaching the biggest cities of the ancient world. Eventually, he knew God would bring him to Rome. Now, let me ask you this. Why would the gospel go from major metropolis to major metropolis, step by step. Because just like now, then cities were the centers of influence in the ancient world. That's where money was. That's where education happened. That's where political centers and government happened. And God is interested in reaching human beings from every social level. From every social level, the poor and the rich, everyone, needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul would come to the synagogues to preach to the Jews, but he would go also to, to, to houses of learning in the ancient world, to places where people could have conversations. He would be in the market. He would be using his trade. He would use any means to bring people to Jesus Christ. But the gospel made it to a very strategic city. Now, here's the challenge. Does the gospel work just with those who are nice? or with those who are not so nice? How about people living in the mud? People living on the very bottom of society, can the gospel do anything for them? Let me tell you this. If Corinthians could be saved and becomes trophies of God's grace, everyone can be saved. Everyone. The gospel made it to a place where people were used to all the worldly pleasures and all the worldly attitudes of the ancient world. And by the way, they haven't changed much. Idolatry and immorality, those are your two sources of every other sin. They were proud, they were loud, they wanted what they wanted. 
And the gospel makes it there. And as the gospel makes it there, begins a process of transformation. Let me give you some context. By the way, it is to the Corinthians that Paul writes the longest letters. At least two that we have, First and Second Corinthians, incredibly long and very personal letters. Letters that show the struggles of the church. Letters that show that the church wasn't perfect, but that their position was so strategic to reach out to the rest of the world because if God could save the Corinthians, everybody can have hope. Let me tell you what that salvation was all about. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 31, so you catch a glimpse. Uh, we can catch a glimpse together of how God changed their lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Listen to the message that Paul preached right there to the Corinthians. says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. It is not your human wisdom that will get you salvation. You may be incredibly politically powerful. You may be a person that boasts about being wise. But the only wisdom that will get you eternity is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God revealed through Jesus Christ. And Paul calls that the word of the cross. The word of the cross is the message that Jesus Christ, God the Son, came to this world to give his life to do what we couldn't do. With his death, Jesus Christ paid for our sins. You and I are sinners, and we sin because we're born in sin. There is nothing we can do to pretend that we're righteous before God, but Jesus Christ took our sins upon him. He died on the cross, was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead to pay for what we couldn't. The truth of the scripture is this, that we all deserve to be condemned. It is easier to point the finger to those who are more apparently broken to those whose sins are louder, to those whose sins seem to be darker. But the bottom line in Scripture is that we are all, we're all sinners. There is no righteous, not even one. And God in his wisdom sent a Savior, Jesus Christ, to rescue us from the impression that we can do it ourselves. And look at what Paul says in verse 20. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, the city of Corinth was meant to be this magnificent megaphone to show the world and to shout to the world and to amplify for the world to see the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if Corinthians, notorious sinners, could be transformed into godly saints whose life looked like Jesus Christ, isn't that what hope is all about? If your sins don't have the power to hold you anymore, if your vices, if your destructive habits can be broken, if those chains can be broken, there's nothing that our God cannot do. So our God is a God of hope that, is, that wants to shine his light in the darkest of places. And Corinth, half a million people embedded in sin, was going to become an outpost for the gospel. Now, there are cities that pride themselves in being Wonderful places to raise a family. Let me tell you this. If God can save the overt and open sinners, he can also save self-righteous people. He can. But self-righteous people, because of their pride, many times fall in unbelief faster than notorious sinners. Remember that woman? Remember that woman that came to Jesus and the Pharisee was in the house? The woman is crying on Jesus. 
washing his feet with her hair and her tears? What's the Pharisee thinking? Oh my gosh, if this guy were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him, that she's a sinner. That's all he can see. You know why? Because in his mind, he only has room for one person, him, not even Jesus. So Jesus talks to him and says, let me ask you a question. See this woman right here? Yep. I came into your house. You didn't greet me. You didn't kiss me. She's been kissing my feet. You give me water to wash my feet. This woman has been washing my feet with her tears. She loves much because she's being forgiven much. Those who much is forgiven, they love much. How much do you love? You see, we're in a suburb of Dallas with all the comforts that America can provide, all the nice things of Southern living, nice potlucks, nice churches. If we get comfortable in our pew, we may miss the strategic position that God's given us to show the world what Jesus can do. Now, by the way, Dallas is one of the strategic global cities of the world. We have one of the busiest and biggest and most effective airports. We have tons of seminaries and Bible schools. We have tons of churches. But Dallas is not quite Vegas, is it? No, we are the buckle. The buckle of what? Of the Bible belt. Well, those pants are about to fall off, let me tell you. <laughs> they are about to. They're about to because you know what? If we get too comfortable and we're not the church, and if we judge Vegas just because we're Dallas, and even better, Duncanville, nicer, more family friendly, maybe the doors will close because of self righteousness and unbelief. But if doors were to close here, he'll open them somewhere else. Remember what Jesus told the Pharisees? The kingdom of God is taken away from you and given to the people that bear their fruits. So here's the FPC question. Are we going to be a place that strategically positioned to be an open door? Or are we going to be a closed door? Because we want to be who we want to be, not who God wants us to be. But right here in Corinth, see the gospel makes to the city. Don't worry, we're in verse 1. We're just in Corinth. Position is important. But that's not all. There's one more thing I want to share with you. Platform. The gospel makes it there. Some of them believe right there in verse, verse 6 says, When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments, said to him, Your blood be on your heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. He left there, went to the house of a man, and then worshipped a man who worshipped God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. Many of the Corinthians here in Paul believed and were baptized. So there, here comes the fruit. Here comes the harvest of the Lord. And, and look at verse 9. Beautiful. There is a direct command from the Lord and revelation. In verse 9 says, The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. There are only a couple of times where God so directly intervenes with special revelation for a place just like this. This is one where God tells Paul, Paul, when some doors close, I want you to keep your eyes on me and I want you to keep on sharing. Yes, it can get scary at times. It can get intimidating when they're persecuting you, when you're facing the forces of darkness and they're pushing back. But one thing you cannot afford doing is this. Do not go silent. Do not go silent. Speak for me. And he says, I have a lot of people that belong to me in this city. What? In the darkest of places? Yes. In the most challenging of places? Yes. The Lord knows how to rescue people, doesn't he? He does. So he tells Paul, do not go silent. Now, how powerful was the city? How powerful was the church? Did they have all the budgets? Had they figured out all the ministries? Man, you read the letters to the Corinthians? These are divisive people. These are people that are all drawn, uh, drawn to, to crowds by appearance and eloquence. These are people who are very dysfunctional. They're very immoral. And yet right here, God has a lot of people. And he says, do not be silent. Keep talking. This is going to grow. He stays a year and six months. So let, me tell you, let me tell you why. Come with me to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 to 9. I want you to hear who your Lord is, Lord Jesus Christ. 
Is God going to open doors of opportunity for the gospel because we're good looking, because we're rich, because we have the budgets, because we have tons of leadership? Hmm. He's going to open doors because of who he is and who, what he wants to do. Revelation 3, 7 through 9. Revelation 3, 7 to 9 says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. To another church that was struggling with some shut doors, Jesus says, I am the one who holds the key. Keys in the Bible are a symbol of authority, of who's in charge, who has the right. And Jesus says, make no mistake, this world is loud, governments can get against my word, but ultimately I decide what doors open, what doors close, and how long they stay open. Right here, the platform that God was going to open for Paul was even going to touch on the political life of the city. If you remember right there, Paul is brought before the authorities, and right there, in verse 14, when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallius said to the Jews, the proconsul, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime or Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names of your own law, see it yourself, I refuse to be judge of these things. So here's the big opportunity. In all places, ironically, Corinth was a place where the government had a policy of religious toleration. The Jews had been expelled from Rome because they, the gospel was growing everywhere and they didn't like how people were rallying around Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus, not Caesar, is king. So the Jews had been expelled from Rome, but right there in Corinth, the gospel had an open door without the government persecuting. Religious toleration will always give the gospel an opportunity to prove that the gospel is better. Always. So where there are freedoms to think, freedoms to examine what people believe, the gospel will flourish. You know, research after research, the Pew Research Center has several articles about this, shows that one of the reasons why younger people don't want to be in evangelical churches anymore is this, that young people identify the message of the gospel with the political right. When you make the gospel buddies with any political party and pastors and leaders start endorsing this or that candidate, let me tell you what's going to happen. Make no mistake, the gospel is going to lose. You know why? Because the powers of this world want what this world wants, not what God wants. You and I as the people of God have been called to embody the values of the kingdom, and you're going to make up your political mind. You're going to make up how to use your rights as a citizen in this land. But make no mistake. We, as ministers, are not to champion publicly anything but our loyalty to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of reasons for all the social maladies that affect us. There is plenty of teaching in the scripture that talks about all sorts of topics. But first things first, our job is not to endorse a political platform. Our job is to represent Jesus Christ and represent him really well. So you have, hey, it's right here, right? You know, interestingly, this Roman official got it clearer than the religious people. You guys figure out your faith, and then you live out like people that live for the glory of God. So right there, the platform that they had allowed them to have the impact for the gospel that the Church of Corinth later on had. It. So don't let politics, don't let politics get in the way of your faithful witness. Don't be silent. Speak the name of the Lord. Speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray for your government. Pray so we can live at peace. And also, your representatives, your president, Congress, city government, everyone needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, we have lost people ruling. They need the forgiveness of sins, don't they? 
We need to pray for every one of them that they will come to the saving faith of Jesus Christ. So our platform, our platform is one of gospel presentation, of evangelism, of missional engagement, not political power. Second, I'm sorry, third, last one, partnerships. Did you notice how some of the people that got brought to the gospel were people that had some prominence? The ruler of the synagogue became a believer. And not only that, you had other people, Priscilla and Aquila, they were Jewish people. They, they left Rome, but they, ha- they, f- they met with Paul right here providentially. And did you notice that Paul had a trade? He was a tent maker. They established partnerships to be planted for the long run. Sometimes God will use and open doors at, through, through other means than just pastors. And even pastors, they, they, they need to have some other tools. Did you know that there are countries in the world that are close to the gospel where a pastor or a missionary cannot go? But maybe a software engineer can go. Maybe a doctor can go. Maybe somebody that has a trade can go. Somebody that has money and can invest in a business can go. What if every person that has some training, a trade, a profession became a missionary? What if every one of us, whatever tools we have in our toolbox, what if we could take them out and through partnerships, open spaces that bless society, but lift up the name of Jesus really high? That through the way we treat our employees, through the way we serve and do a profession, and through our words, we can show the world what God does to save us, his words and his works. Remember that church, Philadelphia? It says, you have not denied my word and my name. The biggest thing we have as a tool for missions, is that we can incarnate the Word of God. We can show the world with our works, with our trade, with our profession, with our families, that the gospel works, that the gospel does save us, and that sometimes will allow us to raise new partnerships. Priscilla and Aquilia became their brothers and sisters with Paul. If you can read in Romans 16, 3 to 4, it says they risked their life for the gospel. They're my dear partners in the gospel. You see 1 Corinthians 1, 1, when he writes the letter, he says, our brother Sosthenes, the one that was getting mugged right there, he was a close companion of, 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 prisons, of prison of Paul's ministry. These were people that were going to do life together and ministry together. Do You notice the last one right there in the passage, Apollos. Apollos becomes a powerhouse for the gospel. And those partnerships allow them to raise new leadership. Guys, there will be people right here at the FBC that will grow to be missionaries, that will grow to be pastors, that will grow to be doctors, lawyers, you name it, that will be plumbers, that will be so many things, maybe our own grads. But what what we would love as a church most is that every one of us becomes a disciple maker. Somebody that glorifies God. Somebody that glorifies God and invites others to follow Jesus Christ. If our kids, if every one of us does that, guess what? The harvest will come. So, let me close with this. Paul spent two years, almost two years right there with them. Almost two years. The the whole missionary journey was almost two years. This the second journey. Two years for the gospel to be planted and to be ready to make it all the way to Rome through the ministry of Paul. The gospel was already there, but God uses Paul to bring it all the way home and write the letter to the Romans. Every experience, every place we go, when we represent Jesus Christ, drives our life to the fulfillment of God's purposes. When some doors shut, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged because for every door that is closed, God will open many more. Stay faithful. Don't be silent. Speak. For he has a lot of people following. You're never alone. Sometimes you may feel like Elijah right there after Queen Jezebel. I'm the only one left. No, 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 no. Even in the darkest of places, God has 400 people that haven't bent their knee to Baal. You're part of a big family and a big team. You're not alone. Stay faithful. God will open the doors. The FPC, church family, and I've told you this many times, we're not the the prettiest girl in town, are we? 
In the Bokel, there are so many beautiful buildings that house churches, so many if effective and efficient. We're not the pretty girl that people are looking to come to church, but we don't need to be, and we don't want to be. We want to be who God wants us to be. So the FPC is not the church that people are looking for. Maybe you just stumbled today. It's your first Sunday because you drove by. We welcome you. This is what we're going to be. We will be the church that God will use to look for the people that God is looking for. Go. Go and make disciples of all nations. The doors will open. Let me pray for us. As we come to the table today, maybe you're struggling, trying to reach out to people in a dark place. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your job. Maybe your coworkers are not friendly to the gospel. Today, we're here to come to the table and to ask the Lord to open new doors. On my right and on my left, every Sunday, we have people that are ready to pray for you. Maybe the prayer you need is a relationship. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's a child. I don't know what it is. If you need somebody to pray for you, on my right and my left, as we come to the Lord's Supper, as we sing this morning, come. Let us be the body. Let us lift you up in prayer before the Lord. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that we get to come before you and that you open all the doors. So as we come to the table, we remember what you've done. I pray for a church, Lord, that we'll be a church of disciple makers, Lord, where everyone is growing to be more like Jesus, Lord. Don't let us be intimidated by the opposition. Don't let us be intimidated by the forces that oppose the gospel. Help us to be, Lord, all eyes of Jesus on Jesus. He is your wisdom. He is your power for salvation. So we thank you.